Hi, my name is Patricia Tomowski, and together with Scott Douglas, we are co-founders of HealingALS.org. And today we have with us Dr. Richard Bedlack. Uh, Dr. Bedlack got both his medical degree, MD, and his PhD in neuroscience, and is founder and director of the ALS Clinic at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. He has been working with ALS patients since the late 1990s and has published over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles, mostly related to ALS. Dr. Bedlack has been studying and documenting dozens of ALS reversals since 2011 and is currently involved in a number of ALS research projects, some of which he will be discussing in this talk. Thank you, Dr. Bedlack. Well, hello, everybody. Hello. Greetings from North Carolina. It's my pleasure to be here today with you virtually to tell you what I've learned about ALS reversals. And what I thought I would do today is just tell you a little bit about my experience with ALS progression before 2011, tell you about my first encounter with an ALS reversal, and then show you what I decided to do about it. Show you how I'm defining and collecting ALS reversals, tell you why I think these are worth studying, tell you about some hypotheses that we have for explaining these ALS reversals, and then update you on the ROAR and STAR programs I have going on here at Duke for studying these ALS reversals. So I saw my first patient with ALS around 1997 when I was just a resident here at Duke University. And I'll always remember that case. I'll always remember how amazed I was by that person's story and physical exam findings and how horrified I was when my attending came in and said, you know, we know what to call this, but we don't know why it happens. People with ALS always experience rapidly progressive disability and shortened survival. And there's really nothing we can do about it. You just have to go home and get your affairs in order. And it was that day that I drove home and decided I would stay here at Duke and try to change the culture when it came to ALS. And I'm happy to say that I've been successful. I've, I've built a very large multidisciplinary ALS clinic and I've been able to integrate research into that clinic. And I've now seen about 2,500 different patients with ALS that have come through my clinical and research programs here. And I've learned a lot about ALS progression in that setting. First of all, I've learned how most people measure it. We measure progressive disability using something called an ALS functional rating scale. This is abbreviated ALS FRSR. It's 12 questions. Each one of these questions is um, related to a specific motor function, a specific body function. So there's a question about writing, a question about feeding, a question about dressing. Each one of these items is scored between zero, which means you can't do it at all, to four, which means you can do it normally. And if you look at a large population of people with ALS, this scale defines, uh, declines fairly linearly at about an average of one point per month. We also measure survival in terms of something, or we also measure progression in terms of something called tracheostomy-free survival. And that means how long does a person with ALS live before they have to be attached to a ventilator. Now, why do we measure it that way? Well, once you get attached to a ventilator, you don't die from ALS. If you die, you die from something else, usually an infection. So this is really the only way to measure survival from ALS is tracheostomy-free survival. And again, if you look at large populations of patients, the average tracheostomy-free survival is about three years from symptom onset. But it's pretty clear that there's a lot of variability in this disease between patients. So on the left-hand side of this slide, I've got a group of patients whose ALS FRSR scores were followed over time. And you can see that these curves are wildly different in terms of how fast they're changing. So some people are changing at about five points per month, and some people are changing at probably about a half a point per month over time. So that's a tenfold variation in progression. There's also a huge progression between pa uh, variability and progression between patients when we talk about tracheostomy-free survival. 20% of people with ALS can live more than five years, 10 live more than 10 years, five live more than 20 years. And there are very famous examples of people living more than 50 years from their ALS diagnosis, like for example, Stephen Hawking. 
one thing that was not widely appreciated by anyone until we published this article a few years ago is that there can be variability in progression within a patient at different times during the disease. And so we did a project, my colleagues and I, where we looked at a giant database of people with ALS that have participated in previous clinical trials. And we focused on the patients that were in the placebo group. And we looked at how these individual patients did over time on their ALS FRS R score. So in the upper right hand corner of this slide, you can see one patient's ALS FRS R score over time in the placebo group of a clinical trial. Now clearly this is not a linear progression. There's a very slow progression for about 350 days. And then between day 400 and day 550, there's no progression at all. And then at the end of this patient's participation in the study, they actually started to get a little bit better. They actually started to recover some function for some reason. The other way to look at this is to look at different degrees of ALS FRSR stability or improvement lasting different amounts of time in patients in this database. And that's what that complicated graph in the lower right-hand corner of this slide is. So the blue line is a percentage of patients that had a stable ALS FRSR lasting different amounts of time. The green line is patients who had a one-point improvement. The red line is a two-point improvement. The aqua line is a three-point improvement. And the purple line is a four-point improvement lasting different amounts of time. And there's several things to take away from this slide. First of all, it's not that uncommon for people with ALS to be stable or even to improve a little bit over a very short period of time, like for example, six weeks. If we look at six weeks, we can see that 70% of people in this database had a stable ALS FRSR over that period of time. But it becomes less and less common over time for people to sustain these degrees of improvement. So only about 5% of people in this database were stable for a year. And only a very small percentage of people, like one to 2%, had significant improvements in their ALS FRSR score that lasted six or 12 months. So that gives us some real good insight into what we can expect in this disease. But what caught me totally by surprise was this case. So this was around 2011. I was working on an ALS untangled investigation of energy healing. And I came across this website where there was a video describing the story of a person named Nelda Boos. This was a person who had gradual painless limb onset weakness at age 43. And over the course of six months, progressed to where she had very little movement of her arms and legs. In the video, she reported that she eventually progressed to total paralysis in the arms and legs and said that she was told by her ALS clinic there was really nothing more they could do and it was time to go into hospice that the end of her life was near. She even started to give away some of her possessions. And then over the next two years, with the help of an energy healer, she gradually got better until finally she got all the way back to normal. And Ms. Boos is still alive now in Virginia. She's 80 years old and she appears to have totally normal motor function. And so um, like a lot of things that I see on the internet, at first I found this hard to believe, but over a few months time, I was able to find her and to uh, get her to send me her medical records. And this story amazingly is absolutely true. Those records confirmed to me that she absolutely had ALS. She was seen by some of the best neurologists in the country. She had all the right history documented, all the right exams, all the right EMGs, an amazing amount of tests to look for ALS mimics. She really did progress to where she was essentially quadriplegic, paralyzed in the arms and legs and near death. And now she appears to have recovered to completely normal. And so I had to ask myself, are cases like these worth studying? And I think you know the answer by now, but... Um, uh, the first thing I thought about was, well, how do we currently model? How do we currently get ideas for studying ALS? Well, we have animal and we have cell models, and there's problems with both of these. So the animal models that we have, they're based on inserting abnormal genes into different kinds of animals like mice and rats and flies and fish and worms. And while we can learn something about ALS from those, most people with ALS don't have abnormal genes. And so that may be part of the reason why 
so many drugs that work in these animals do not work when we take them into people. We have a newer model for ALS. It's a cell-based model where we scrape the skin cells of a person with ALS and we treat those skin cells with stem cells. We treat, we treat them with viruses to make them into stem cells. And then we can take those stem cells in a dish and treat them with chemicals and make them into almost any cell we want, including motor neurons. And so we can actually get motor neurons from people with all different kinds of ALS in a dish. And we can see what's, you know, what's wrong with them. And we can dump drugs onto them to see if different drugs might make those problems better. The thing is that we're doing a lot to these skin cells, treating them with viruses, treating them with other chemicals. That means we don't know for sure that these cells are behaving exactly the way that the cells in the brain and spinal cord of people with ALS do. It's also interesting that other fields have learned something from looking at people who did unexpectedly well with the disease. So the best example I can give you is in the HIV field. There's a group of people called elite controllers. This is about 1% of everybody who gets infected with the HIV virus. We've known for 30 years that this 1% never gets AIDS. They never get sick, even though most of them don't take any medicine. And so for a long time, people just shrugged their shoulders and said, well, I, I don't know what, what's going on with these folks. And then finally, someone said, well, maybe we should study them. Let's put them all in the same database. Let's do things like get some genetic testing on them. And it turned out that most of these elite controllers had a genetic abnormality. They had a, a, a variation in a gene called CCR5 that had never been seen before. And so scientists immediately said, well, what does that gene do? It turns out it codes for a protein in the surface of all of our cells, which you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. And HIV needs that protein to get into cells. And in these elite controllers, because of the abnormality in that gene, the protein looks different and HIV cannot use it to get into cells. So Pfizer immediately jumped on this discovery and built a drug that blocks CCR5 and it works for everybody with HIV. And so by studying a group of people who were unexpectedly resistant to HIV, a drug was developed that works for everyone. And so maybe by studying these ALS reversals, we can learn something about the biology of the disease and give that to everyone with ALS and make everyone resistant to it. And so if you're gonna study something, first of all, you have to figure out how to define it. And so for me, I wanted to set the bar very high. To call something an ALS reversal, I've got to have medical records that allow me to confirm the ALS diagnosis. That means there's gotta be evidence of the right history, the right neurological exam, the right EMG, and the right amount of testing to rule out mimickers. Those records have to convince me that there's objective evidence of progressive weakness to a point where a person is disabled. Those records have to convince me that there was a dramatic and persistent recovery of lost motor function and at least some of the disability. So what are some examples of the kinds of things that I'm looking at? Well, for somebody who was dependent upon a ventilator and can now breathe on their own. Someone who's swallowing got so bad that they needed a feeding tube and now they can swallow on their own. Someone who lost the ability to communicate with their voice and now can talk normally. Someone who was wheelchair bound and can now walk or even run. Someone who is completely dependent upon another person to accomplish their activities of daily living, their ability to feed themselves and dress themselves and use the toilet and now they can do that on their own. So those are the kinds of things that I'm looking for. And how am I doing that? Well, I'm advertising. So I'm advertising on a website that I created, on social media, on talks like this, on webinars around the world to doctors and the patient community. And I've had some terrific help from Tish and the group at healingals.org. They've helped me to find several of these folks. And as of right now, today, October 2019, I've got 43 people who I've confirmed as having ALS reversals. And so the next thing you have to do after defining it is you have to come up with some hypotheses. What are some possible explanations? Well, my colleagues think that these were probably misdiagnoses, that these people never had ALS in the first place. So that's one hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that maybe there was something different about these people in the first place, something endogenous that allowed them to overcome the disease no matter what kinds of treatments they took. And then the third possibility is maybe they actually did something, took something when they got ALS that worked. 
And so let's start with the first one. I myself do not think that these 43 people had ALS mimickers, and the reasons are as follows. First of all, I've looked at their charts. They have classic histories, they have classic exams, they have classic EMGs, all typical for ALS. They've had extensive testing for ALS mimics. If these people had an ALS mimic, it was something that no one's ever described before. Second, about 10%, four out of 43, have a family history of ALS. That's the exact same percentage as people with more typical ALS in large databases. So why would 10% of 43 people with ALS mimickers have a family history of ALS? It just doesn't make any sense. And then the third thing is, muscles that had recovered strength in these patients had evidence of re innervation by collateral sprouting on EMG. So not every one of the 43 reversals had EMGs, but several did when they recovered. And what we saw in those muscles is the same thing that we see in people who recover from polio. We see gigantic motor units. So let me explain that a little bit more. On this slide, you can see the normal situation. Imagine that this is a muscle that has four motor neurons innervating it. And then you get sick with something like polio or ALS and you lose one of these motor neurons. It dies out. So now there's only three. And as this goes away, the muscle gets weak. But if the body can clear the problem like it does in polio and maybe in these ALS reversals, the cells that are left alive send off branches. So now this muscle is fully innervated by three motor neurons instead of four. It's fully strong. But this muscle will never look normal again by EMG. Even though a person perceives it as full strength, when we stick a needle in it, it the motor units are gigantic. And so these people didn't recover by magic. They recovered in the exact mechanism that we would have expected them to if we were looking at another motor neuron disease like polio. So if they're not mimics, what else could it be? Well, I've got a program called STAR underway. And in this program, I'm trying to find as many more of these cases as I can, put them all in the same database so I can look at their demographics, their disease characteristics, their comorbidities, the things they took, and compare them to those same categories of patients with more typically progressive ALS in other large databases like PROACT and the National ALS Registry. I'm trying to get biological samples on as many of these patients as I can so that I can look at their genetics, eventually look at their microbiome, eventually look at the tissue in their brains and spinal cords. And I'm trying to ask them as many questions as I can about things they might've been exposed to. And so here's what we know so far. Compared to patients with ALS, more typical uh, ALS that are in large databases, the folks with reversals are younger. On average, they're 50 years old. The range is anywhere from 18 to 75. They're more likely to be men. 34 out of 43 were men. They're more likely to have limb onset disease, 40 out of 43, although there were three with bulbar onset. They progress faster before they start to improve. And they're more likely to have taken certain alternative therapies. So um, when we analyzed the first 36 of these reversals and compared them to people who were in PROACT, these were the treatments that were more likely to be associated with ALS reversals in descending order of significance. At the very top, curcumin, followed by luteolin, followed by cannabis, followed by azathioprine, followed by copper, followed by glutathione, followed by vitamin D, followed by fish oil. Now it's important to remember that this does not mean these treatments caused ALS reversals. These are just the treatments that were most likely to be associated with ALS reversals. And we'll get back to this later. Genetics. So we've now collected genetic um, material on most of the 43 ALS reversals. And those samples have been sent to my collaborators at the University of Miami. And the DNA is being extracted and the whole genome sequencing is being run. And once we have that, we're going to be comparing the DNA of these ALS reversals to the DNA of people with more typically progressive ALS. We hope to have that information in the next few months. But remember, this is, in my opinion, the most exciting possibility. Remember what happened with the ALS resistance gene in HIV elite controllers. If we could find an ALS resistance gene, we might be able to figure out what that did 
and build a drug that does that in everyone and immediately leap to it to an era when we can make ALS reverses, reversals happen more often. Environmental exposures. So we've got some preliminary data here. We've got a questionnaire that exists in the National ALS Registry. And so we've been able to administer this questionnaire to 20 of the 43 ALS reversals so far. And we wanted to see what was different about the environment of these folks compared to people in the National Registry with more typically progressive ALS. And the short answer is so far, there's only one thing that's jumped out, and that is a difference in the longest job held. ALS reversals were significantly more likely to have been woodworkers compared to people with more typically progressive ALS. Now, I don't know what that means yet. It's a completely uh, out of the blue, surprising finding but we've been doing some reading now on woodworking and the kinds of chemicals that people might get exposed to and we're trying to think of an experiment that we might be able to do in some of our animal models to expose the animals to these kinds of chemicals for the beginning of their life and see if we change what happens to the eventual emergence of ALS in those animals. A project that we're just gearing up to start is one where we're going to look at the gut microbiome in these patients. So it turns out that there's a family of organisms, viruses and bacteria that live in all of our guts. And uh, in recent years, it's become very clear that this might be critical in driving the progression of neurodegenerative diseases, including ALS. There's an amazing paper that was just recently published where they took one of the animal models of ALS and artificially changed the animal's microbiome. And just by doing that, they were able to dramatically speed up or slow down the progression of the ALS in that animal. Three out of four studies that have looked at this so far in people with typically progressive ALS have found that the microbiome looks different than it does in healthy controls. I'm going to be doing the largest microbiome study in history later this year to see if uh, I can confirm that the microbiome really does look different in people with typically progressive ALS. And I'll be using the information I gather in that study as a control group to look at the microbiome in the ALS reversals. But that is a very plausible reason why this might have happened. Maybe the microbiome is very different in these people who had ALS reversals. And then last but not least in 2020, I hope to start this study, and that is a collection of brain and spinal cord tissue. You know, uh, if some of these ALS reversals eventually pass away from old age, we would love to get them into the National Institute of Health's brain bank and uh, get them into the rapid autopsy program because I would really like to see what the histology of their brains and spinal cords looks like compared to people who died from typically progressive ALS. There are some very specific abnormalities in the brains and spinal cords of people with typically progressive ALS. Namely, there are these inclusions that occur. And so if people with ALS reversals have those same inclusions, there wouldn't anymore be any doubt about whether they had an ALS mimic. And so now there's one other program I want to tell you about that I'm doing with these ALS reversals. It's called ROAR, Replication of ALS Reversals. And it's, it's asking the question, could these cases have happened because of the treatments that these patients took? Now, at first glance, that might seem surprising that patients actually discovered the effect of a drug or a treatment when doctors and scientists had no idea, but it's happened many times before. There's an entire branch of drug discovery called serendipitous drug discovery. The most famous example of it is Viagra. That was being studied by Pfizer for heart disease, and it didn't look like it was gonna work and it was gonna be thrown away, except that men in the study came forward and said, I'd really like to have some more of that drug. And uh, the scientists said, we had no idea that it could actually help with erectile dysfunction. So from the patient reports, they completely switched gears, did trials for erectile dysfunction. It worked. It became the first FDA approved drug for that. It became a billion dollar blockbuster drug. Again, discovered not by clinicians and scientists, but by patients. And so in this ROAR program, I'm doing small pilot trials of the treatments that were associated with these reversals. And because I'm looking for such a big effect, I'm looking for a reversal. I'm not just looking for a slight slowing. And because most of the things that these patients took were pretty safe, they were classified by the FDA as GRAS, generally regarded as safe, and that's why they can be sold 
in supermarkets and on amazon.com and things like that. I can do some neat things with these trials that I think patients are really gonna like. I don't need to have a lot of rules. Just about anybody in my clinic can be in one of these ROAR trials. You know, pharmaceutical companies do trials and they have a lot of exclusions because they're trying to homogenize the population. We talked earlier about how noisy this disease is in terms of progression. So the rules allow you to sort of dampen down the noise when you're looking for a small signal. I don't need to do that. I'm not looking for a small signal. I don't need a placebo in these trials. If I've got patients in one of these ROAR trials that were wheelchair bound and they can walk at the end of the study, no one is gonna say that was a placebo effect. I don't need a lot of in-person visits. In fact, I don't think I need any in-person visits. I can teach people to measure things in themselves and check in on them by telephone or by video every month. Um, again, you need a lot of visits when you're trying to measure something very fine. I'm looking for a huge thing that should be very obvious to everyone. I can actually use an online database called Patients Like Me and teach people how to register for an account and enter the things I teach them how to measure into that database on their own. And the advantage of that is that the results of these ROAR trials are available to everyone in the world in real time. I'm not, I'm not you know, entering data into a secret database that's locked in my office only to be revealed when the trial's over and analyzed. This is a, right out there for the public to see in real time. And finally, because I know there's people all over the world that want to try things, when I get my protocols approved by the FDA and the IRB, I'm going to publish them on my website so that folks all around the world who maybe don't want to or can't be in a Aurora trial can at least have a roadmap that they can follow for self-experimenting with something that seems reasonable. And so I've already done one of these Aurora trials. I, I finished this trial a couple of years ago, published it earlier this year. It was of a product called Lunacin that was associated with a really dramatic ALS reversal in Providence, Rhode Island. Unfortunately, um, I couldn't find any other ALS reversals in this trial. I had 50 people on this product for a year. The other unfortunate thing was that this product wasn't quite as well tolerated as I expected. Many of the patients in my trial had side effects from it, including some cases of constipation so severe I had to hospitalize patients to get them over it. But the good news about this trial is that this unusual design I used worked really well. It was the fastest enrolling trial in the history of ALS. We enrolled more than nine patients per site per month when most trials enroll one to two patients per site per month. We had a very diverse population. Some people that had ALS for 10 and even 20 years were in this study. Some people that had tracheostomies and ventilators were in this study. The good news about that is when you use a diverse population that's reflective of what you see in a real clinic and you get a result, you can assume that the result generalizes. If you only take a fraction of the patients that are in a clinic, like 5% of the best of the best, and you get a result, how do you know that that result applies to the other 90% of people that might be worse off than that 5%? We also were able to show in this trial that once we taught people to measure things, they could do it very accurately for a year. And they did go on to patients like me and they did enter all the data that we asked them to every month with minimal prompting. And so that means in the next trial, we can do it totally virtual. We won't need to have any visits. And last but not least, by publishing the protocol, we were able to show that we empowered hundreds of people all over the world outside of the study to follow a roadmap and maybe to self-experiment with something that was maybe more reasonable than they were gonna try on their own. And so we're gearing up to do the next ROAR trial and as you might have guessed from that slide I showed you a little while ago, it's going to be of this product called curcumin. This is the thing that's associated with the most ALS reversals. Five of the 43 ALS reversals were on regimens containing curcumin. This is a, a chemical that you can see in the lower right-hand corner that's in a lot of spices like turmeric and curry powder. It's got several plausible mechanisms by which it could slow, stop, or reverse ALS, including altering the fecal microbiome. It's got two uh, positive clinical trials that were done in other countries. It's got positive preclinical data from the animal model. And it seems to be a very inexpensive, safe, and well-tolerated product. And so this is the design. As you can see over on the right-hand side, the inclusion and exclusion criteria are quite minimal. You've got to you know, be able to consent to a study so you can't have advanced dementia. You've got to be able to use a computer and have access to the internet because we're using that Patients Like Me website. You've got to be able to live for the six-month duration of the trial. 
And so we'll have to look at the medical records and make sure that it looks like a person is re reasonably stable and can live for at least six months. But we're gonna be looking for 50 people with ALS all over the world. We're gonna be asking each one of them to get me a healthy control from the same household. And the healthy control is only gonna be there to supply microbiome samples. All the patients in the trial are gonna be treated with a specific type of curcumin called Theracurmin at a dose of one capsule twice a day. All the people in the trial are gonna be taught to measure their ALS functional rating scale, their weight, their perception of how effective the therapy is and their perception of side effects. And they're gonna be entering that data in patients like me every month. And we're gonna be comparing the data that they enter to matched controls from the patients like me database. So for every patient we enroll, we will match them to three people in patients like me who are not on curcumin as far as how they're progressing before they start the study. There'll be no in-person visits required. These will all be virtual visits. We will be sending the product and we'll be sending kits for saliva and stool collection throughout the study. And um, just like in our other Roar trial, the results will be available on patients like me in real time and the protocol will be published once it's IRB approved. So just to leave you with a quote that I think summarizes what I've shown you so far, these ALS reversals, as well as me, there's no such thing as a weird human being. It's just that some people require more understanding than others. We've got these ALS reversals. There's 43 of them so far. They're rare, but they might be very important. They might be pointing us to endogenous mechanisms that can fight the disease or even new treatments we could use to reverse the disease in other people. We've got a way to define these. We've got testable hypotheses. We've got protocols underway for studying these at Duke. But it's really important for folks to remember, right now we don't know why these people got better. Just because some treatments are associated with ALS reversals doesn't mean they can cause ALS reversals. We've got to study that. For folks who want more info, we've got a couple of websites to point you to, the Duke ALS Clinic website and the ALS Reversals website. And I'll just finish by thanking everyone especially the patients you know, who are present at this meeting. Um, I know it's not easy for you to be at meetings like this. All the work that I did is based upon questions from patients. All the work that I did is based upon funding that comes from patients. Mainstream funders still think that this work is kind of odd and they're not sure that these cases are real. And so right now, all the resources I have come from patients, especially this particular family, the LVH ALS Foundation. I also want to thank my collaborators all over the world, especially my Duke ALS care team. I had to build a foundation of great patient care here to be able to do all this exciting research. You have done an amazing job. Just, I just got to thank you because the only reason, people would never listen to us. Before you published that paper in 2017, oh, yeah. even though you were out there, they didn't listen. They, yeah. have, they are now listening, well, which great. is, and you know, our goal for the conference, by the way, is actually we want to start, start a start changing the standard of care like what is it about and the microbiome study i'm so excited yeah that's, that's going to be cool that is fantastic so your work is giving these reversals credibility still running into skepticism today we just had a we um there's a really cool new book out which is called last ride of the iron horse and it talks about uh probably about a one month als reversal that lou gehrig himself had and the author of this book called me and we had like really detailed statistics statistics from every day of the last year of his major league career. And there was just this huge spike in the, in the month of August in his batting average and his slugging percentage. And we tried to get that published in, in several different journals because we thought playoffs, you know, Yankees are in the playoffs. Everybody's always interested in stories about Lou Gehrig. No one had ever shown this before. And uh, the reviews just always came back with the same thing, which is, you know, we, we don't believe ALS reversals exist. We don't think these patients ever had ALS. So you, need to stop talking about ALS reversals. So there's still a lot of skepticism. We, ne we never get that paper published, so frustrating. Well, look, yeah, it is frustrating, but good for you to keep going on because there, people are now taking it seriously. I'll send you the slides right now. Great. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Okay. See you later. Thank See you, you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yep.